Genshin's late game experience has always been wildly different to the early game. A little over a year ago, I created a second Genshin account to help refresh my memory, expecting to play through the first couple of regions and then let it go. Instead, I've kept it going, albeit at a very casual pace, and it's become an experiment to see the game through the eyes of a fairly casual free-to-play player. It's been pretty eye-opening. There's so much that is easy to forget, and there were some surprises that I hadn't even noticed the first time. There are a couple of different perspectives from which I found this particularly interesting. First, I wondered what kind of advice would actually be useful to a free-to-play player. A heck of a lot of Genshin discussions assume you have characters, equipment and constellations which free-to-play account just starting out will not have available. What can you do when the general advice doesn't help? And as a light spender, I was curious how strong the builds in a free-to-play account would be once it reached the end game. While every playthrough is unique, I remember finding it frustrating when I was starting out that I could never find a clear walkthrough of what a normal account should look like a year or so down the line. People were more focused on whale accounts, novelty challenges, or outliers who had hyper-invested into certain characters. When that's all that gets talked about in detail, how can you tell how well you're doing? But this account has reached the end game by now and is currently AR59 with 29 fully built characters. Since I don't want this video to be two hours long, we'll have to be smart about this. I tend to think of Genshin as split into early game, mid game and end game. The definitions are a little arbitrary, but I quite like using two specific achievements as an easy way to pinpoint when someone passes each threshold. Onwards and upwards unlocks when you ascend a character past level 80 for the first time, which means you're past AR50. To people who haven't reached this point yet, it might feel a little too far, but the game changes noticeably once you get there, and as you'll see in a second, it also makes sense in terms of how long it takes. Down we go unlocks when you clear floor 12 of the abyss for the first time. You don't need to get any stars of course, but your characters have to be strong enough to not only survive the battle, but defeat the enemies within the time limit. That's about as clear a marker for this account is entering the endgame as we can hope for. On my alt account, this means the early game sections lasted a little under 3 months, the mid game lasted 5 months and it took roughly 4 months from entering the end game to getting 36 stars, a year in total split roughly into thirds. This video will focus on early game. If my schedule permits and people are interested, I'll follow up with a video each for the other two sections, including the time when Dea was the missing piece. For now, let's talk through my game plan, showcase the current builds for the characters I relied on in the first few months while discussing how the free-to-play experience altered my experience with each of them, and finally take a look at the more general details which stuck out to me as a veteran starting again. The early game in Genshin is where people's paths diverge, leading them to unique and interesting challenges before converging again in the end game. Even whales have a limited roster of characters available early on, and combat strategy and resource planning is different for everyone as a result. My plan was to let my very early wishes guide my approach at first. With few wishes available, the characters I received would dictate what teams I should play, and I just hoped it to be different to my early experience on my main account. I particularly wanted to avoid main DPS characters which I use a ton on my main account, and to follow my common advice for people to collect the most powerful supports first, though as you'll see, that ended up not being a concern at all during the early game. And, of course, I would avoid weapon banners, except for the rare circumstances where both 5 stars are great and the 4 stars are also excellent. This account started with a bang. The very first temple on the novice banner went gold, and it turned out to be one of my favourite standard characters, Jean. Her build is a good example of how on a free-to-play account you will inevitably have to compromise, especially when it comes to weapons. The best option I have for her to this day is the Favonius Sword. It's necessary for her to keep her burst available, but feels a little wasted due to her lack of crit rate, since she's unable to reliably trigger its passive. In my main, I would have just replaced it with a weapon she can make better use of, but on this account I just don't have anything which would be an improvement. Building characters on a free-to-play account is much more of a puzzle since you're forced to make do with what you have, and the trade-offs are more significant. 
The second character I pulled was Yanfei and I was just as happy to have her. She's a fantastic DPS but on my main account I already have well built Klee, Hu Tao and Yomiya so she's been way down the priority list and to this day is only built as a shielder. Right from the early days of my alt account Yanfei was my main. One detail I had forgotten is the pain of low stamina gameplay. It affects exploration but also drastically changes the combat experience of many characters. Yanfei more than most. Her playstyle is focused on her charge attacks, so she felt very restricted by the small stamina bar, especially when at lower constellations. It's obvious that any character who relies on charge attacks benefits from stamina increases, but it has an even stronger effect on gameplay than you might think. I prioritized collecting the oculi to raise the stamina bar quickly as a result and highly recommend it. I also had some good gacha luck for Yanfei specifically getting her to C6 surprisingly early on. Her cons reduced her stamina usage significantly which made her much more comfortable. I also got Shangling very early, both from the early abyss and from wishing. While I had been tempted to skip fishing entirely on this account, I wanted it to be authentic to the free to play experience, so in the end I gave in and I fished for the catch, which belongs to my Shangling. Shangling quickly reminded me of how low energy gameplay makes characters feel extremely different. Many characters are used exclusively for their burst, Shangling being a prime example, and they usually have high energy requirements which are almost impossible to meet early on. Guides tend to assume that you have enough energy to use your bursts as soon as their cooldown ends, but having looked at dozens of people's early to mid game builds, this is actually pretty unusual. I resorted to building all of these characters exclusively for ER during the early game, ignoring the artifact main stats some of the time. Even if the stats and set were blatantly incorrect for their needs, the benefit of having smooth rotations with consistent elemental application was far more valuable. I also got Kaching and Mona fairly early on. One from the standard banner, one from a lost 50-50 and used them quite a bit in the overworld. For a long while Kaching was my other main DPS on this account. I even farmed her artifacts a little bit and bought her a crit sword from Paimon's Bargains so she has a pretty decent build overall. Mona also has a surprisingly good build and I used her often in a couple of different teams. She was particularly handy as a driver in a Hyperbloom team which are particularly worthwhile for free to play accounts due to the comparatively low investment required to achieve good damage output. However, they are both great examples of how quickly the standard 5 stars fall behind on a free to play account. You end up with fewer constellations for them than you would otherwise, so the gap between the C0 limited 5 stars and the standard ones can be a little more obvious. From a utility perspective, Mona in particular pales in comparison to Kokomi in my experience, despite her omen buff being so strong. As much as I enjoy the two of them, I rarely use them later on. Genshin's occasional events which reward users with free 4 star characters are even more valuable when you're free to play. I picked Yao Yao from the 2023 Lantern Ride and she drastically improved my Hyperbloom team. One of the reasons I picked her is that she's absolutely fantastic at C0. While I do disagree with the general consensus on the value of certain characters constellations, it's undeniably true that some have a noticeable advantage early on. This is especially important on a free to play account since you're much less likely likely to get those constellations. Yao Yao also doesn't require a lot of investment and her healing is top tier even with a low investment build. Aiming for these kinds of characters to supplement the others who require more attention helps unlock a lot more flexibility in team options and makes a huge difference to the early game experience. The last character I got before graduating to mid game was Xing Cho, who instantly replaced Mona in my strongest teams. This is partly because I happened to have pulled a number of copies of the Sacrificial Sword and had a high refinement copy of it ready and waiting for him. He's one of the most dependable characters in the game, even at low constellations, especially when you want consistent hydro application. I managed to put together a 4 piece emblem set for him, because as I rediscovered through the experiment, Genshin Impact is basically emblem impact. When you've already farmed it enough, it's easy to forget just how far ahead the emblem domain's flexibility and utility is compared to the vast majority of other domains. Whenever I had spare resin, this is the place where I'd spend it. Not because I was grinding for any specific character, but because it was the sensible thing to do. Other artifact sets can be valuable if you have resources to spare, but when your time is limited and much of your resin goes to ley lines, it's just so much easier to default to the emblem domain. 
So those were my early game characters, a decent mix which could be combined into a bunch of different team combinations. Aside from the characters themselves, the biggest contrast to my main account is that I stuck to the advice about character leveling which I ignored the first time around. It's very easy to fall into the trap of leveling all your exciting new characters once you start getting more at around AR30+, plus. and on my main I had spread that investment out across 20 or more characters by that point. Focusing your investment into just a few really does make the game heck of a lot smoother. This time, I did not encounter any of the difficulty spikes which I had experienced the first time around. I pulled a number of other fantastic characters early on, but focused my investment on those few I've mentioned so far, plus Dendro Traveler. I also built Kaya, partly because he provided an element that would work well with my gacha characters, and partly because he's another who I had neglected on my main. Out of the others I pulled, I was particularly tempted by Beido, Kole and Rosaria, but I've used the first two a lot on my main and I didn't want a second cryo so early on. There were a few other things in early game which I either forgot or just didn't expect. The Mondstadt and Liyue story was way shorter than I remembered, and while it's nothing on the later ones, it was better than I expected. Mondstadt is also much more fun to explore than it's given credit for, though it would benefit from some expansion since it's absolutely tiny, maybe some cave systems for example. I've already touched on it in passing, but the lack of stamina early on is one of those details which is really easy to forget, especially because the later regions which experienced players are more likely to be exploring have much more advanced movement mechanics available. This was most painful when climbing mountains in Liyue. They should honestly go back and add spirit curves permanently to the whole nation through some story quests since the current experience is not good. Replaying the game made it clear just how huge an advantage you have early on if you already know what you're doing. With resources being so scarce in a free-to-play account, this is doubly important. Fully free-to-play accounts have much more of a disadvantage here than people realize. Building characters was painfully slow due to lack of mora, wit, books, especially in the beginning. The battle pass makes a huge difference to the progression of your characters. I had to farm a lot more ley lines on my old account in the early game than I did on my main, and the builds at the end of it were still not as good. Resource management has particularly strong effect on artifacts since if you want to build a decent roster of characters, each individual will have less investment. Combined with the rarity of free-to-play friendly crit weapons, you tend to have to be picky about who you build crit stats on. My personal rule of thumb is that if I cannot reach at least 50 to 100 crit ratio, it's not worth building crit, and instead I'll double down on the character's main stats. Several of my builds follow this pattern. Even with crit circlet Changling, Xingqiu and others would have awful crit stats, so instead they have an attack circlet and their damage is perfectly fine without relying on crit. For what it's worth, this is often my approach even on my main account, and it has served me well. In contrast, Yanfei is the only character on this account who has a limited 5-star weapon, which was a lucky win on a whim when I had some spared primo gems. As a result, her build is pretty strong and she has comfortable crit stats. It's often the gacha gods who dictate which of your characters end up being the strongest. In some ways, the early game has changed a ton over the past few years. I've explored some of this in more detail in my video asking whether it's too late to start playing Genshin, but the part which made the most difference for me was actually starting in post Sumeru world. With Dendro available, the difficulty curve is noticeably different. Teams built around reactions like Hyperbloom have much more generous power progression, so it's easier to reach good damage numbers with less investment. They're also less straightforward and intuitive than the original reactions though, so more casual players might miss out on this advantage. Aside from that, the one thing which I promised myself I wouldn't do this time is rush, and of course, Hoyo got me there. There was a point in the early game where you're just one or two levels below the requirement to take part in events, and missing out on those free weapons or characters is painful. For this account, that point was during version 3.3 with the Umbrella Sword. I pulled an all-nighter to get it before the event ended. Totally worth it. Playing through the early game once more was a great nostalgia trip, and turned out to be a fascinating look into how different Genshin can feel. If you're a free to play player or just getting started, you can rest assured that while your experience will be different, the challenge can actually make it more fun. And if you're an experienced player, hopefully revisiting the joy and pain of an early game brought back some good memories. We've only covered the first 3 months of this account's existence, and none of the 7 limited 5 stars on the account have shown up at this point. So if you'd like to see some more, then let me know.
there's a lot more of this story left untold. Until next time!